Good afternoon and welcome to our event. Uh, today we are hosting a discussion on the most significant update to Jenkins in a decade. Before we get started with our plan talk, I want to give you a brief overview of who we are here at Fierce Software and to set the stage for the discussion. Fierce Software is a small woman-owned value-added reseller specializing in enterprise open source technologies, complementary market-leading DevSecOps capabilities, and secure data platforms. We differentiate ourselves in the reseller market by consistently delivering on our core capabilities. We are an innovation broker to leading technologies, connecting our customers with commercial innovation. We are a licensed manager, streamlining customer fulfillment and reducing administrative burdens. We are customer success oriented, ensuring successful technical support through vendor trained and certified professional services. And we are customer enablement focused, delivering workshops and webinars like this to educate our customers about new features and to train teams through hands-on events so that they get the most from their purchases. As a reseller, we represent a portfolio of capabilities and this allows us to meet our customers where they are, to hear their challenges and to work with them to find complete solutions to their problems, oftentimes with multiple products. To do this, we keep very close partnerships with our uh, commercial vendors, and they recognize this unique value that Fierce brings to them by thanking us through public acknowledgments and um, other uh, things such as Partner of the Year and other recognitions. The most important thing we do here at Fierce is helping our customers get access to the smartest people and the best technology. Today is no exception. With that, I want to introduce today's topic. The focus of today's webinar is Jenkins and the biggest performance and scalability update to Jenkins in a decade. Behind this is CloudBees, the largest backer of open source Jenkins and the provider of CloudBees CI, the enterprise Jenkins solution. Our goal today is to spark a deeper conversation with everyone who's joined us. We want today to be just the start of that conversation. As a part of that, please feel free to post your questions in the chat and during our conversation, um, and then when I get towards the end of the hour, I will have a chance to review those questions and we'll kind of be able to address the ones that we can. Okay, from there, let's get started. My name is Tim Behinke. I'm the DevSecOps strategist here at Fierce Software. And joining me today is Tyler Johnson, the federal CTO for CloudBees. Tyler, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tamba. Thank you for everyone who's attending today, and I really look forward to a really insightful and exciting conversation around the updates that we provided to Jenkins recently. Brilliant. Okay, so I think our conversation is coming really at a perfect time. Um, as I look across government, I am seeing some very, very promising motion in the CICD space and DevSecOps adoption across government. Um, I'm seeing more contracts that are setting expectations for CICD. I'm seeing DevSecOps as a standard of delivery at almost every system integrator, which is encouraging to see. Um, I've got government adopting, I've got industry delivering. Um, personal passion of mine is DevSecOps at scale. So when I think this, I'm thinking enterprise level and agency level. And we have seen all kinds of growth in DOD and the software factories across all of the federal civilian market with enterprise teams that are standing up these uh, platform teams, these shared services teams, and really starting to drive into these different pieces. Uh, we've got great government uh, advocates and innovators who are really pushing the technical and more importantly in government, the bureaucracy. Uh, that is the, the biggest impediment for DevSecOps adoption is really the processes that we have today and just are we ready for that speed of capability? Because believe me, industry is bringing that speed. So we've got excellent engineering teams in our system integrators that are really trying to push and increase the speed of delivery. Um, at the center of all this, DevSecOps and CICD is a household name, Jenkins. Uh, and for enterprise scale Jenkins, it's Cloud BCI. So Tyler, uh, we've got you here today to talk about the biggest update to Jenkins in a decade. So tell me about the update. What is it? What drove it? And why is it so significant? Yeah, so thanks, Temba. And I have to agree with Temba's sentiments, especially in the federal landscape of software development, right? CICD is becoming more and more prevalent. We see software factories popping up. We see massive shared services organizations providing 
an automated service to these application data and infrastructure teams in order to kind of support the mission and get production applications and production services out to the front line as quickly as possible. And, and like Jenkins, like Temba mentioned, you know, Jenkins is and has been a leader in the CI CD world for over a decade at this point. And for those of you who aren't super familiar with CloudBees, that's where we got our start, right? So our uh, one of our founders or our first CTO, Kasuke Kawaguchi, he created the Hudson project, which then eventually morphed into open source Jenkins. And then CloudBees adopted it and made an enterprise version of that solution that we'll talk about more as we go on. Um, but we're really dedicated to furthering the capabilities of Jenkins. And like Temba mentioned, we've made some massive strides in the past couple of months with huge edits and massive feature additions to the solution. And primarily what we're going to focus on today is bringing high availability and horizontal scaling to the forefront in Jenkins, which hopefully everyone who's listening now knows how incredibly important it is because any CI, CD or automation engine for, you know, is really the, the backdrop or the, the spine of every software development and deployment process. So making sure that you manage those applications like a Jenkins environment, the same way that you would highly resilient, uh, resiliently build your production mission capable applications is very important. So that's what we really wanted to focus on here today. And there's some other things as well. And we'll talk about some of the differences between open source Jenkins and CloudBees as well as some other additions such as workspace caching and pipeline explorer as we go through our discussion today but specifically what temba is really talking about is our highly available version of jenkins that was just released here in september and ultimately what we're trying to accomplish is what you see here in the graphic right bringing jenkins to a mission critical application building that resiliency and giving you a true active active ha model inside of the tool itself. So essentially what we've done is we've taken Jenkins and our version of Jenkins is really meant to scale, have a multi-tenant architecture, allow you to disperse workloads of teams between different uh, Jenkins controllers, have their own role-based access control, their own plugins, their own jobs, so that they're very isolated, but can still be centrally managed, which I'll show you more about later as well. But as we do this, you know, we need to make sure that each one of those instances is highly available, very resilient. And the way that we're doing that is introducing out of the box an architecture that allows for a shared file system, a load balancer in order to route this traffic between two identically replicated Jenkins instances. Furthermore, this is what that architecture looks like in our release. And this is something that's been really highly anticipated by our government users. And I'd love to hear more from Temba here in a second about what he thinks about highly available applications and the significance of that, especially in the government. But for those of you who are long-term Jenkins users, you may realize that this is something that took a lot of customization in the past. But now as we roll it out uh, on the cart, we have a load balancer that now routes traffic between the two replicas. We leverage a shared file system. And then we're using a Hazelcast library, which essentially handles all data replication and configuration replication between the two separate replicas. So now it's much more hands off. It's much easier for you as an administrator. And with this, you have a very stable ecosystem in order to run your Jenkins builds. Interesting. OK, so high availability. Um, I mean, as I think about uh, the resilience of some of these things, it, it changes as the as the context changes, right? So if I've got only a few users, high availability doesn't matter all that much. But as I look at uh, these platform teams, especially the software factories, um, teams of teams, um, that really starts to matter. So and even on the industry side, when I think about contract execution and really where some of this stuff would apply, it's gonna be large corporate systems, it's gonna be large contracts, or really any place where uh, in that team of teams kind of ecosystem, I, I can't have a loss of Jenkins. I can't have builds fail for certain things because there's contractual consequences to that. Um, and every single time one of those things fails um, and there's no plan, that's just, I mean, honestly, we're all taxpayers first. Um, and that's that's not good to have some of the rework that goes with this. So I think the larger our scale goes, really the more important this kind of thing kind of becomes. Um, 
So now that I've kind of got that perspective, um, how does this update change the administrative experience, right? Um, what don't people have to do? So when you say it's built into it as a part of it, is this, you know, truly hands off or is there, um, I mean, because people were making high availability, but they were kind of hacking their way through it. So can you talk a little bit about uh, some of those details and really what goes into, into that? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really great point. And I think Temba brought something up there um, that I think is really relevant because CI, CD pipelines and Jenkins just as a, as a whole, right? When we think about their mission critical components, it, it's really changed from like, I'm gonna push a new feature for an application to production. That's not all that Jenkins does now, right? It does a lot of infrastructure management. It'll do patching. It'll uh, facilitate an automated way to remediate a uh, higher critical vulnerability. These are super critical uh, capabilities and super critical automation processes that Jenkins facilitates for any government agency, right? This is your path to fixing and updating many of the assets that a single agency or program is responsible for managing. So you really can't have this in a down uh, system. It, it's, it is a mission critical application and should be treated that way. And that's why HA is such a huge improvement for CloudBees. And, like Temba brought up, this was something that could be done in the past, and it was sort of a hacky way of doing it within Jenkins. And even when you did build it out in an HA capability, it was active passive, right? Hot and cold. And a lot of this meant that there was a replica that you were in charge of managing the replication of the configuration, everything that would be stored in like a Jenkins home directory, your plugins, your jobs, your permissions. That's largely on you as administrator. There are some tools to help replicate that service. You also have to stand up and manage a load balancer. You also have to stand up and manage that shared file system. And again, those replicas, one is active and one is completely passive, taking no workloads. A big difference in what we've done now is this comes out of the box. You don't need to manage that data replication. We're using Hazelcast to do a lot of that as a part of our September release. And furthermore, these are both active replicas. So one thing that uh, we have at the top of the slide here is HA slash HS. So for those of you who may not know exactly what we mean by HS, that's also horizontal scaling. So what this means is that I can also disperse pipeline builds or workloads across both of these nodes. They're both active participating Jenkins controllers in my ecosystem. And that means that I can balance workload between uh, maybe controller one and the replica controller two. So I can have it set to balance different amount of work between the two separate instances. And, and furthermore, this capability, especially when we start to think about how the world is moving more towards containerization, and as you start to embrace containers, you start to look at things like Kubernetes and any orchestration platform for containers, you can also start to do really uh, more complex and more sophisticated ways of doing updates and testing them, like rolling restarts. Now that I have an exact replica of my controller, I can do a rolling update on controller one and all of my work is not lost. I don't have a blackout window. I have no downtime because controller two is going to pick up the baton and it's going to carry all of the workloads while I test out the functionality of a new release or an update on controller one. So it's really a powerful way to bring you know, a zero downtime environment to Jenkins. And, and doing this out of the box means that administrators aren't responsible for handling all of that configuration replication. They're not responsible for scheduling the blackout windows. They have a happy user base that is constant access to Jenkins. And they also have an environment where they can, you know, confidently test and uh, validate whether a new update is performed correctly on like a single controller before they roll it out to the controller too with zero downtime, which I think that is a massive, massive enhancement to every Jenkins-based shop that's using it. Well, brilliant. Uh, it certainly seems like you've made somebody's life easier. Um, and you, you mentioned the uh, just how much as we as we as we went from simply CI CD to build applications, the DevSecOps and infrastructure as code. You're right. What we have around Jenkins and around the CI CD kind of ecosystem is our entire infrastructure is now dependent on how we're running these pipelines and what's happening. Our entire you know, failover and fallback plan uh, and recovery becomes really dependent on these systems to be available when we need them 
so that we can respond to incidents or different things like that. Um, so I think this is a significant, uh, you know, update for, uh, especially when I look at the industry base, that's where I see a lot of the impact of this happening. I'm thinking proposals get easier. We can start to thin down the number of people that it takes to maintain some of this infrastructure needed for DevSecOps. Um, and we can pivot those same people to, you know, higher value add tasking. Uh, instead of looking at trying to hack your way through high availability Jenkins, it's a feature. Um, and so now those people can move on to, um, you know, maybe it's the next things. It could be SOAR, it could be any of those other pieces that you really need to start thinking about how your automation and how your ecosystem really works together. So I think this is a, a huge boon for, for our system integrators. And then on the government side of that, um, I think we can start to expect these kind of efficiencies. A, a low efficiency platform teams are just really not taking advantage of all that is already available to them. Uh, so I think we can start to amp the standards up and say, hey, I expect it to be high availability, and this is a feature, this is not hard to meet. Um, and I think that that's gonna be good for government, and I think it, it raises the standard across the board for how these critical platform tools um, really fold into the, uh, the execution of, of programs for government. Brilliant. Absolutely. And, and Tempe, you said something there that I kind of want to highlight, right? And this is something that you'll hear in every CICD DevSecOps discussion. You know, DevSecOps is people, process, and technology. And I think Tempe really hit on the people there, right? The administrators. And that is kind of our guiding light here at CloudBees as well, which is let's enable those people to work on building really, really cool, sophisticated things. And I think if you're spending all of your time hacking together like an HA environment or just keeping the lights on for whatever CICD tool that you're using, that time's not being spent building cool things. So we want to empower those users to have more time to spend supporting the mission, working on you know edge case uh, applications or environments. And as the government is becoming more multi-cloud focused, embracing Kubernetes, embracing containerization, there are a million really cool ways to uh, stand up your environments, interact with all of these different PSP uh, solutions, and really embrace some of the cutting edge things that we see happening in the commercial world as well. So I wanted to highlight that. We really want to make Jenkins that great solid automation engine that is super powerful that enables the people at the end of the day. Perfect. So I want to move on to some other updates, but before we do, I want to circle back on, on you know, I realize that some of our attendees uh, may be open source Jenkins users. Uh, the features we're talking about here are enterprise features available in Cloud CI, which is enterprise Jenkins. Um, and they're really, uh, they target the, the complexity and the brittleness of what happens when you try and scale open source Jenkins. So um, at scale, you know, you start to find the limits of the open source. Uh, and so what I want to do, Tyler, is ask, um, we've got high availability and horizontal scaling. Where else um, have we kind of built Cloud BCI just a little bit differently as we think about the problem and the challenge of scale? Tyler, you're muted. Apologies. I wanted to share this graphic with you all around how we're different than open source Jenkins, particularly in the architecture set. And a lot of this is why we're making these type of enhancements. As we kind of move forward, we're talking about workspace caching, which is a problem with more advanced, more ephemeral based CICD engines. And what you'll see in this graphic is the architecture of our enterprise Jenkins capabilities. You know, it's really built to scale for the enterprise, like Temba mentioned running a multi-tenant Jenkins environment where each team or each application process has its own controller with its own plugins, with its own permissions, with its own jobs. And they can all be administrated from a single control plane, which we call the Cloud-based Jenkins Operations Center or the purple box in this environment. And there's this whole concept in Jenkins and hopefully a lot of our listeners to this are already practicing this, but pipelines are the way that Jenkins has gone for many years now. We wanna stay away from freestyle type of jobs. And when you use pipelines, there's this approach called distributed pipeline architecture, which is really embracing agents that are specifically designed to accomplish a single task in that pipeline. Things like you know, Maven projects or node projects, they have dedicated agents in order to facilitate the build, the test out and deployment of 
those applications, including things like rolling out infrastructure. But when we start to embrace this, and when we move to containers, we realize that these agents no longer need to be static, right? In Kubernetes, I can define this as inline YAML, and it'll spin up from the Kubernetes control plane, attached to my Jenkins controller, execute as a part of my pipeline process, and then spin down. And this is super, super powerful because one, I'm embracing the elastic nature of a Kubernetes engine, which means that I can scale up dynamically to meet virtually any amount of workload that may come in uh, based on the amount of controllers or jobs kicked off at a single time. And then also it's ephemeral, meaning that each agent is clean when it comes up. And also it is spins down so I get to save on my cloud spend. So I don't have all of these static instances floating around that I constantly have to patch and update or, or wipe the memory on and update for all of the different users that may be onboarded to a new platform. It really solves a lot of those problems but it also introduces some problems to Embo, which is what we're going to talk about here in a second as well. And that's really all about uh, workspace caching. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, as you were describing this in my head, I'm like, okay, this is this is how it kind of expands. Um, where where does this, you know, what else do you have to do to really make this work at scale? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, going back to that, that slide before, and I know we're talking a lot about ephemeral agents and Kubernetes. One thing that I want to point out here for the HA capabilities and even you know, scaling, you can use CloudBees on-prem as well. It is not dedicated to just cloud-based installs. It's also not dedicated to just containers or Kubernetes. It can function across virtually any infrastructure set that you'd like to use. But where we see a lot of folks moving and what we kind of prescribe as a best practice is adopting something like Kubernetes because it does scale super well. I mean, we're running a multi, you know, a very distributed architecture with multiple different Jenkins controllers and a single control plane with an operation center. Kubernetes is really the most efficient way to do this. But again, when I have those agents that spin up and are the exact same version of the agent each time because they're ephemeral, they're just defined as a, an image that resides in a registry, either on Docker Hub or maybe you store them in your internal Nexus or Artifactory or even a cloud service provider based registry. Sometimes you have data and artifacts that need to persist from build to build. You know, common projects like an NPM or a Maven or a Gradle, they come to mind because there's a lot of dependencies. And one of the problems with this ephemeral architecture and this distributed pipeline architecture with lots of different agents is the fact that now I either have to manually load all of those dependencies into each container as it spins up as a part of my agent architecture, or I still need to maintain static instances that are heavy and bloated with all of these dependencies so I can maintain that workspace from build to build. And oftentimes it may be from branch to branch as well as you're working inside of your you know, Git-based uh, source code management tool. And this is a problem because it's slow, it's not performant. If I'm waiting to install a bunch of dependencies as I spin up my agent and then I run my steps, that's not ideal. And then also sometimes people will cache some of the artifacts or the workspace back to the controller in Jenkins. And this is just as a best practice as a whole, kind of goes back to what I was saying about pipelines versus freestyle jobs. We really want Jenkins controllers to just be orchestrators of Jenkins jobs and the agents. We really don't want the controller doing much or any lifting. That is your config central, it has your plugins, it'll interpret the syntax of your pipelines, but it really shouldn't be like a data warehouse and it really shouldn't be running jobs. We wanna keep that controller super lightweight, keep it really robust, eliminate any of the brittleness or potential downtime that that controller may you know, incur by storing a lot of workspace or running tasks on the controller and caching it back to the controller again is it, super slow. So what we released is this concept of workspace caching. And in this current iteration, it supports just S3 as a storage class, but we are adding more to that. Um, luckily, at least in most of my conversations and Tembo, you could probably agree with this, almost everyone is using AWS GovCloud in some capacity. So S3 is kind of a fundamental component of AWS. And with this, you can actually cache the entire workspace, all of those dependencies back to another storage device outside of the scope of Jenkins. So that way it's not impacting the performance of your CI CD pipelines. You can push it to S3, and then you can also pull it back down from S3 if you wanna continue the build. Let's say you spin up a new agent or you wanna run from build to build, like iteration build one to build two, 
that cache is still persistent, but not, again, on the file system in Jenkins. So we're totally separating this. We're, we're speeding it up by pushing it to S3 rather than storing it on the controller. And with this, you get to both embrace the ephemeral nature of agents, start to think like custom containers for those agents, start to embrace Kubernetes, but you also start to eliminate the downside of a non-persistent agent base, a non-persistent workspace that we carry over from build to build. Yeah, I think about, you know, some of those that could apply is, is in when I look at um, our deliverables to disconnected domains or from industry base to government. So a government deliverable, I've got it, you know, in my uh, industry factory and I'm ready to deliver it to my customer. You know, it becomes this this nice way of, of transitioning um, uh, build artifacts and all the other elements that I need so that I can move it into, it could be a secure classified domain or it could be uh, into an on-prem network that is a little bit more isolated. Um, so the more important the, the government or public sector mission, oftentimes the, the more we start to isolate it. And this strikes me as a, a really valuable element to, to thinking about that movement across these, these disconnected domains. That's a great point. It's something that I wanna call out that we do, and, and you know, I particularly pride our company on being really good at meeting our customers where they are. So we do a lot of work in the DOD and the IC, a lot of those are disconnected environments, and Temba is kind of an expert in these edge-based uh, disconnected environments. And the fact is that CloudBees can be installed in a completely air-gapped, disconnected environment. We have things in Cloud One, we're part of Platform One and the Iron Bank. If anyone's not familiar with that, it's just a hardened registry that has our container images available. And when we are installed in an air-gapped environment, just like Temba mentioned, everything that we do, we also want to capture as code. So it is an artifact that is version controlled, that is auditable, just like your production applications, which makes these extremely portable. So if you need to port config from one disconnected environment to another, that is very possible. And that, that's not really why we're here to talk about today, but it's something I want to call out because we did bring configuration as code, defining your entire Jenkins environment as a YAML manifest to the solution about a year and a half ago as well. And this is a huge part of our government kind of install basis today. It's really focusing on that modular version controlled auditable config base that's stored in whatever version control repository you want to use. But this absolutely rolls directly into that same idea of how we meet those customers where they are. So I think this is starting to get at, um, you know, if I looked at uh, workspace caching and I looked at um, high availability, I start to say, mm, if I'm a system administrator, maybe I care. No, actually, I do care. I care that I'm a system administrator and my life just got easier. But if I'm a user, uh, tell me, have you got anything that's more user-oriented focusing that you guys are working on? Tell me about something that 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 people can see who are going to be the average everyday user? Yeah, great great question, right? And that's really who we care the most about, are the people that have to interact with Jenkins. I mean, being able to administrate it and being able to roll it out as an administrator, that's really, really important. But if the users don't like it, we all know really who holds the power in a development organization. And those are the developers, right? Those are people that are working on the solutions. And if they don't find whatever automation tool that you're leveraging to be easy to work with, they'll probably pivot and look for something new. And this is a credit to just open source Jenkins as a whole. And we maintain a lot of the open source components as well. And it's still beloved by a lot of developers, right? It has a massive plugin ecosystem that allows them to embrace all the new and cutting edge tools that they want. It's over 2000 strong now. Uh, but something that we did just release and something that Temba is alluding to is a new log visualization tool. And it's called CloudBees Pipeline Explorer. And I think this is really important. And uh, it's something that I personally was very excited to get as a common Jenkins user. Uh, and this is a really good way to transform the way that you interact with, debug, visualize the logs from your builds, right? And some of you may be familiar with a different plugin that we used back in the day. It was called Blue Ocean, and we actually released it to the open source. And Blue Ocean had some of this visualization built into it. And I know for a fact how widely loved Blue Ocean was, because I hear it all the time, like, Where, when's Blue Ocean going to get released? When are we going to get an update to Blue Ocean? 
we're, we're bringing something new, right? And Pipeline Explorer is that something new. And hopefully, as you can see here, this is the visualization of the CloudBees Pipeline Explorer plugin. And anyone who is on a more recent version uh, can install this as a plugin today, and it'll start immediately giving you this visualization of your logs. So we're moving from that you know, white console dump view of a Jenkins pipeline, which is not particularly easy to transition. And if you're like me and you've seen some massively complex Jenkins files, we're talking thousands of lines long, invoking scripts written in Groovy, maybe triggering some other application code, it can get very confusing to determine what happened, who triggered this, were my tests successful, is this possibly gonna go to production or where do I like, pick up the pieces and, and fix my build? And this is what we brought to the table with Pipeline Explorer, which allows you to install this directly on your controller as a plugin and every job going forward, you'll have this visualization in the view like you see here on the slide. So it won't be retroactive, it won't reach back and let you see your builds from six months or a year ago, but it is a step in the right direction for kind of bringing that user experience to uh, the people that are in the tool every day that need to debug the pipelines, need to understand what happened and, and even more importantly, understand the structure of a pipeline. So like you see here, a few things that it does really well. It has a built-in search. It's highly customizable. You can change the colors. You can show timestamps. You can format the time. You can filter based on the different branches. You're able to uh, search by just a particular branch. You can see what's nested, what's running in parallel. These are all things that were very difficult to do in a standard console dump. If you read through it and you catch the right line, you may see these stages are running in parallel but actually in the console, it looks exactly the same. It's just one standard text block going all the way down. And that's really not ideal when we start thinking about how we wanna debug and how we wanna interact with Jenkins builds that have already been completed. And, and kind of furthermore, what you really wanna focus on here is being performant in the way that you visualize your Jenkins builds. So if you're relying on a third party logging tool, well, that's another tool that you have to maintain. Sure, maybe it's a SaaS tool, but pushing all of your logs to that tool and then visualizing them in another place is probably not the most optimal way to work within Jenkins. I think, Demba, I'm curious because I know there's a lot of logging tools out there. I'm sure this is something that you hear as a consultant all the time between the different tools. You know, is this something that you've kind of heard from Jenkins? Is like, I need a better way to see my builds. Well. I think the um, where this it really does depend on 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 how they want to use it. So in some cases, yes, but a lot of times the real driving need for this I see in government is more on the auditing side of the business. Um, well, side of governance rather, as opposed to side of the business. Um, when I look at um, what happened or after action or something happened and we had. Yeah, some kind of event. I want to go back and start to look at some of the places that stuff went wrong. Um, and I think that it becomes really important when we look at how we do security authorization. Uh, we see in, in DOD, one of the, the, the driving forces recently is the continuous ATO efforts. So the risk management framework as a structure allows, you know, a certain amount of there is a certain amount of control and oversight and governance that goes into this. And what you're really laying out here starts to get towards the ability to get in and explore some of the, uh, the evidence that I'm gonna need to see along the way or uh, the processes. I wanna be able to validate certain things are happening. Uh, and this becomes a, a really good way to like open that up in a way that is a little bit more human consumable um, and uh, trackable more importantly, uh, when we start to look at some of the governance activities uh, that are gonna be around security authorization. Um, so that's the kind of places where I think it, it, it becomes valuable is as we start to make, um, I'm gonna say, we start to apply the bureaucracy to CICD. And, and by that, I mean, um, uh, think about testing organizations or security organizations. When those organizations' equities are represented in the pipeline steps, they're automated into the process. And that doesn't mean that we've taken the bureaucracy and like put it into or over it or around what we've done. That's sort of like the legacy way of looking at it. 
I think what we're looking at here is an opportunity to, to really fold that bureaucracy in as a native, well, DevSecOps native practice. Um, and this kind of visibility is a really important feature for auditability and inspectability. So um, I like it from that perspective because I think it starts to get to how we present things um, as developers um, in a consistent way. I, I agree. And I think you, you brought up something really interesting there from an audit perspective. And those types of personas aren't necessarily the same types of people who've been playing with Jenkins for 10 years, right? No. But they need to be able to check some of those boxes and understand this is what happened in the build. And, and CloudBees does more than just Jenkins. It kind of helps visualize this. And we may talk about that here in a second. But even with something like Python Explorer, I can come in as a complete newbie when it comes to Jenkins. And I have this very consumable view of my pipeline in the Explorer. I can see from a tree view, like you see here, what branches were run, what parallel steps were like triggering another pipeline. I can actually filter or search for a specific tool, which this is something that I see a lot. And I talk to a lot of the government stakeholders that say, I just wanna come in and I wanna see the results of my check mark scan in my pipeline, or I need to see was my container scanned? What were the results coming out of something like an Anchor or a Prisma Cloud, right? Those are just the small little things that now is much easier for that you know, bureaucratic process or that auditor or whoever that approver would be to come in and really visualize what's happening, right? So this is just really enhancing the way that you interact both as a user and a really well experienced Jenkins developer because now you have this beautiful log view that's gonna give you very detailed uh, visualizations of, of errors and actually you can filter as you see in the graphic here based off of just exceptions rather than a tree view, which is the little pyramid with the, the exclamation mark in it. And then also as an auditor, I can just come in, get the pertinent information that I need for my individual step, and then I can move on. And I'm not burning cycles with those developers. Right? We, we want that accessible at our fingertips at any moment. So um, I wanted to open it up and see if there were any questions and, and prompt if there are any questions from the audience to drive that into the, uh, um, the, the chat. Um, we'll give that a, a, a minute here and see if anyone has any questions that were kind of sparked by this, this uh, first conversation. And, and while we wait, I think maybe I can highlight from a just perspective of talking to a lot of shared services groups, the significance of all of these features, right? Um, HA and HS, I think every single agency lead, every single shared services user should care tremendously about HA for every application. So this applies to every single user, consumer, maintainer of Jenkins, right? This is really, Truthfully, the biggest release that we've done to Jenkins in years, especially when it comes to performance and just adding a much more resilient architecture to the platform. Um, horizontal scaling, something that you know we kind of glossed over today, but that can also be massively impactful because you now have the ability to disperse workload over multiple different nodes. So a big concept that we promote here at CloudBees is breaking up Jenkins monolithic controllers. So like a single instance that houses hundreds of developers, thousands of pipelines, that's not super performant and it's brittle by nature. And being able to update that is very difficult. And as a part of it, that's why we introduced our scalable version of Jenkins with many different uh, instances of Jenkins controllers, all managed from a single, single hub, but also with horizontal scaling, you know, you don't have to jump right to a multi-tenant Jenkins environment. You can actually scale that single replica into as many replicas as you choose, especially in Kubernetes, because that can dynamically scale up to like five, 10 replicas of a controller and disperse the workload and try to lighten the burden of that Jenkins monolith. So that's still really important. And then, you know, workspace caching, as we move to an agent-based architecture, as we start to embrace containers and ephemeral agents, this is a new challenge, and that's what happens. And Temba and I, prior to this conversation, we had a lot of talks about all of this great new technology that comes out that people are trying to adopt. You know, people are starting to think about 
How do I get into containerization? How do I embrace a GitOps-based workflow? Some people are just moving to Git, right? And as you make these really fundamental, fundamental technical evolutions, it solves some of the tech debt you had in the future, but introduces a whole new set of problems. And that's what we have here with ephemeral agents and with agent-based architectures. And one of those challenges was the workspace and having to kind of keep that persistent between builds. So that is also really important. And you should think about that as you're starting to roadmap out where you may evolve in your CI CD practices and how you may use Jenkins. And then lastly, and I, you know, I hate to call it a no-brainer, but it really is a no-brainer. The, the ease of installing something like Pipeline Explorer in a cloud-based environment takes under a minute. And all of a sudden, I've gone from this hideously ugly uh, console dump to a you know, ANSI-colored black background, filtered, searchable, uh, really comprehensive view of my Jenkins build. So I encourage any and everyone, if you have the ability to install it right away, it is a very light lift, and it will drastically improve the way that you interact with the uh, Jenkins. So we, uh, the, the question we have is, are all the things we've talked about here today available? So is everything generally available and uh, for the cloud BCI consumer base, these are features they should be looking for and updating and progressing accordingly? That's correct. They are all available today. Um, the version that you would need to be running on is 2.414.2.2, I believe. And that is the most recent that will have all of these updates. We actually just released a new version yesterday, uh, but you only need to be on 2.414.2.2. The latest is uh, .3.7. But that was our September release and all of these are available. And even some of those components, and I know we talked a lot about containerization and Kubernetes, and I, I think that everyone should consider that when thinking just about your CI CD pipelines, even if you're not ready to build production applications that are hosted on Kubernetes, still think about it for your Jenkins environment. But even if you're not there, the HA capabilities are still present for what we call traditional installs, anything not in Kubernetes. So even containers running on EC2, you know, bare metal installs using war, RPM, it's still available. So this is all out today and is you know, readily available for any and all users. So what I want to do as a part of a wrap up here, Tyler, is to, um, to kind of ask a little bit more of an open-ended question on sort of what's next? What, um, as we look at the kind of user requests and the demand from your consumer base, where is the next focus? Um, for the product, for the company, as we look at the evolution of this? Yeah, it's a great question, right? Like all features, even these that you see today, there are gonna be enhancements done to them. Um, for example, some of the things that may have been in Blue Ocean, like a nice, beautiful graphic, we may end up adding that to uh, Pipeline Explorer. Certainly, we're gonna add more storage classes for workspace caching, right? Because we don't expect everyone to just only use S3, so that's gonna happen as well. Uh, when it comes to HA and, and horizontal scaling, there'll be updates to that as well. And, and as a huge part of this, if you're a current customer or even a prospect, and there's some things about Jenkins, like please feel free to reach out to us. I mean, you are the lifeblood for our development teams. Let us know what you want to see. Let us know what enhancements you would love to have in a product like this. Um, and we can kind of relay those on. Furthermore, as a company, you know, we're talking a lot about Jenkins today, and that is really our bread and butter. It's where we got our start. We are the steward to open source Jenkins, much like Red Hat is to Linux, right? But we do a lot more than that. So we've expanded into the world of release orchestration, really focused on the path to production. And something that Temba mentioned earlier, and it's a hot topic in the federal community as a whole, that's really all about how to facilitate things like continuous or accelerate ATOs. How do I parse all of the information from tons of different builds in all sorts of different CI engines and display them in a very clean SBOM audit body that allows my stakeholders, like a release engineer or even an AO, to then approve and accredit that release in an automated process all the way to production. And then we accredit the way that we release software, so we accredit that boundary, and any and all release candidates in the future can inherit that accreditation. So that's something else that we spend a lot of time focusing on. Um, we've also just released, it's about a year old now, and this is something I think is very exciting, and it's a, definitely a hot button issue in the federal landscape today, which is continuous compliance. And we have a compliance engine 
that ingests all sorts of vulnerability and scan data from your CI pipelines and then uses Rego, which is just you know basically a query language that tags all of those findings and maps them back to real RMF controls. And a lot of times, you know, I talk to prospects and customers about this, and this is really kind of groundbreaking because honestly, vulnerabilities on their own, while they may give you a nice thing to look at and give you a path to, to chase down and figure out how do I fix this on a particular application, it doesn't give you a direct connection to the RMF consequences or the controls themselves. And that's what Rego does for you. And what it does is it ingests all of this data, it deduplicates it, it maps it to all of your different environments. It can even stack rank them based on the impact. Is a critical vulnerability in a dev environment as high a priority as a medium is in production, right? And how does that map to a specific uh, control, like a FISM or a FISCAM boundary, for example? And then on top of it, one thing that this does that I think is a, a really huge part of the next phase of DevOps as a whole, and I'd like to get Temba's take on this as well, which is it's extending from just point in time compliance in, the, in a CI pipeline or in a release pipeline. Now it's an event-based engine. So as it's in production, as you may have hundreds of mission critical applications out in the wild and something like log 4 shell is released, that single detection of a vulnerability now scans or triggers a scan on all of your uh, assets in production, in development, in QA, and gives you a real-time view beyond just point in time compliance in the software delivery lifecycle. So this is really enhancing our capabilities all the way out into continuous monitoring. Yeah, I think it is It is definitely the next um, arc as, as we see cyber tools morphing into development tools, development tools morphing into cyber tools. There is this synergy, and, and I mentioned it before when we talk about like like SimSOAR and like the how we see events and how we respond to them. Well, responding to an event is now a DevSecOps activity. So it's not SimSOAR, it's, you know, really it's DevSecOps, like that's what it's supposed to be. And so I think that as we bring our ops in, that's gonna have more and more consequences to development behavior and some of those other pieces that come there. So I do see this as continuously meshing together. Um, and really it's all about understanding these data contexts. Um, security data means something. Um, you know, risk-based context of vulnerabilities I think is really, really important in in a environment where context matters, the the risk profile for a data center with high security is very different than a deployed laptop. Um, the odds of losing a deployed laptop is quite high. And so how do we know what happens? So as we start to look at cloud versus edge, as we start to look at some of these different security contexts for our applications, what was safe yesterday isn't safe because we change the context around us. Um, and I think that the tools are really rising to the challenge of, of this. Uh, frankly, it's a data challenge. It's a data context challenge. Um, and we look at, you know, where is AI going to play a role in this? Where is some of these other newer advanced technologies going to play a role in helping to facilitate what is a profoundly difficult human activity, uh, which is I have a mess and I also have a crisis. Um, so like, you know, so, the, you know, the incident response playbook of, of, of the typical IT world um, has being so impacted by DevSecOps. And I think that that's really going to be something that um, when we look at continuous compliance is going to be vitally important for our government system. Um, and they are, um, you know, vulnerable to this. Uh, and so that's not just on government, it's on the industry partners who are uh, building these systems, is to build better systems. Um, and so I, I, I am, I'm excited by what you're talking about as where the future is going, um, because there certainly is a challenge to be tackled there. Um, and um, yeah, we should definitely uh, update on this uh, sometime in the future. Uh, because I think it's a it's it's a moving target, um, and it's really good to hear how you are kind of moving with that trend um, and trying to be ahead of it and really help the teams uh, go after things. 
Um, we had one other question that was posted during our, our discussion here, which is, are there any kind of upgrade issues that, that could or should be expected with these um, HAHS upgrades? Um, as we look at the rollout of those versions, are there any experiences that, that users should expect? It's generally the same uh, safe harbor statement that I give for virtually any upgrade, which is, uh, you know, make sure generally with, with Jenkins, you may have some plugin dependencies that need to be mapped out as you jump versions, especially if you're making a large jump. Also, as a part of this, you want to make sure that you have access to the necessary requirements for something like HA to be installed, right? Like, can you bring Hazelcast in and can it be installed in your environment? Is it whitelisted? Is it approved? Do you have the resources required to set up a replica or have a scaling replica for um, HA or, or horizontal scaling? If you want to start embracing things like workspace caching, do you have access and do you have the correct security requirements set up for S3? So those are really the only big gotchas. And, and I know that that sounds like it's oversimplified, but that is generally what I come across the most when we think about upgrading Jenkins environments, especially in the federal landscape. So it's really just understanding what the impact is of uh, an update, especially with your current configuration and limitations that may be set in place by your you know, cyber or security teams that could prevent you from bringing a new service like some of these are introducing, right, like Hazelcath into your environment. So those are the, the biggest things. And just a, a blanket best practice here, and this is a huge reason that we really encourage people to stay fairly up to date on your um, releases of CloudBees if you're an existing customer, right? Making a small jump from three months ago to the most recent release that just happened yesterday, not a massive endeavor. But if we're jumping two or three years, now we may have a little bit of a mess when it comes to the versions of the plugins and the versions and the mismatch of things like Java maybe in the background, which we changed recently our support to, to 11. So there's there's some of those things and it's worth keeping up to date and bringing this whole thing kind of full circle just to follow up on that best practice is running a scaled enterprise grade Jenkins environment really helps with this. And that's what Tembo was talking about earlier. And that's really what he's dedicated to, which is enterprise level DevOps. And this means not embracing Jenkins monoliths. It means scaling it out. It means keeping those environments very lightweight, very agile, giving both the ability to upgrade quickly, keep those things up all of the time so that you have a constant ability to uh, embrace new workflows, and then also keeping your end users happy, right? If I'm an end user and I wanna introduce some really cool new tool to my pipeline practices, and I'm on a controller that has a thousand other people on it, what if my plugin that has to integrate with that tool is going to take down that environment? That's not what we want, right? We wanna be lean, we wanna be agile, we wanna keep these scope to individual teams to specific projects so that we can iterate quickly and update those environments. Well, I think that is a, a perfect place for us to uh, wrap up here, Tyler. Um, I really, really appreciate the conversation. Um, and I hope that it was a good opportunity for, for people to learn and uh, to understand some of these new updates. So we have a uh, thank you for attending. Uh, here's our contact information. Please reach out if you need um, any information. Um, we will be following up with all the um, attendees uh, and the people who registered uh, to provide additional resources as well as a copy of the recording that we had from today. So with that, I want to say thank you to all my attendees. Um, and we look forward to uh, being able to support you um, wherever you are in your public sector uh, delivery, whether you're on the public sector side um, or whether you're on the industry side, Fierce is your reseller partner. Thank you. Thank you very much.